Mark Eaton, former center for the Utah Jazz, author, restaurateur, motivational speaker. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate the invitation. Now, you played your entire career for the Utah Jazz from 1982, I think it was, to 1994. Yes. Right? Twelve mm -hmm. years in the NBA, incredible stats. What have you been doing since then, since your retirement? Well, I've done a lot of things, uh, Bob. I've been in the restaurant business for 22 years, as you mentioned, with our restaurants, Tuscany and Franks. Um, for a long time, I ran programs for at-risk youth. I did some broadcasting for the jazz. And the last 10 years or so, I've done a lot of, of motivational speaking, uh, corporate speaking primarily to businesses and organizations about teamwork. Mm. Tell us now, you have a book here. Let me, let me just show it to the folks out there in TV land. Here's the book, The Four Commitments of a Winning Team. Tell us, what are the four commitments of a winning team, and what is your basic message to these corporate uh, clients? Well, the, the premise of my book is really about uh, teamwork from the inside out. It's about getting rid of the internal competition in your organization, and then sharing the stories that I learned along the way through my um, interesting and unusual NBA career, especially the journey to the NBA, uh, starting out as an auto mechanic who couldn't play basketball and ending up an NBA All-Star, and, and through that story, I share with people the, the tips and techniques that I learned that, uh, from, uh, from others about what makes a team really work from the inside out. So uh, there are things like uh, the first point uh, is called knowing your job, doing that one thing you're excellent at. And uh, I had an interaction with Wilt Chamberlain one day at the men's gym at UCLA where he pulled me aside and said, stop running up and down the floor trying to catch all these little quicker players. Your job is to guard the basket and park yourself underneath the basket. That's something you can be great at. Uh, it was a little aha moment for me. And, um, and at that moment, it was like I, I really understood what I needed to focus on and what I needed to let go of. So I really I asked the audience, you know, what's, what's your greatest strength? What's your greatest trait? What's that one thing you need to focus on um, that you're probably not doing now that could, could improve your, your career and your organization? Uh, the second point is about execution, about doing what you've been asked to do. Your job in business is not to do your best, but it's to do what you've been asked. Uh, point number three is about coming here to the Jazz when they're a, a bad team and a bad market. Uh, and our coach Frank telling us if we stopped competing with each other and start cooperating with each other that the individual honors would show up. And so I call that making each other look good, that uh, your job is to trust each other. And, and if the more you play better together, the, the greater chance you have that the individual honors are going to show up. And then the last point is what I did while on the basketball court was I protected my teammates. I, you know, they knew that I, was, that I was there for them. They knew that I had their back. They knew that I'd protect them. And so point number four is really about protecting other people, about really being there for them. Whether you're talking about high-value NBA players or high-value any kind of players in any venue, in any uh, business or industry, what is the key to getting high-value personalities to work together in such a way that all of their individual strengths are maximized? Well, I think there's two answers there. Uh, one is finding people that complement each other well, which are a, a great trait of great um, you know, uh, NBA general managers, finding those pieces that come together. And the other is helping the individual players or employees understand that if they contribute to the well-being of those around them, that their career is going to rise as well. As our, our coach Frank Layden used to say, no one cares if you're scoring a lot of points on a losing team, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants the players from a winning team. So my job coming in from the outside is to help teams understand that, uh, that really the, the key to success and the key to really feeling like at the end of the day I made a difference is the, directly related to my ability to be there for the people around me. And the more that I can be there for the people around me, the, the greater my satisfaction is going to be as an employee as well. You talk about reaching out, protecting others around you, helping others to look good and being a great team player. But when you came to the Jazz at first, those were things you were still learning. So at what point did you finally go, aha, this is how you be successful? Well, I think the, the advantage of having played on a, a, a winning team in college helped me a, a little bit. And then, and Frank Layden was really um, a paramount in this, in this regard because he had taken a team over that was in a, a last place, um, bad team. You know, the, the market wasn't very good. If you, if you recall back in the early 80s, our games were shown tape delay at 11 o'clock at night after BYU, right? <laughs> That's what the market was like back there in the early 80s. Oh. And he convinced us, he said, you know, that, that the key is if, you, if you'll be there 
there for the people around you a little bit that the, the success will come. And a year later, by implementing these four commitments, uh, we won the division for the first time. We made the playoffs for the first time in team history, and we had four individual statistical leaders in the NBA, a feat which has not been accomplished since then. So I led the NBA in block shots. Adrian Dantley led the NBA in scoring. Ricky Reed led the NBA in steals. Daryl Griffith led the NBA in three-point shooting. So the individuals rose to the top, and the team rose to the top at the same time. And pretty soon you weren't on tape delay anymore. No. <laughs> no, pretty soon we got a new TV contract, and, uh, and, and it started a run of 20 consecutive playoff appearances for the Jazz based on creating this teamwork culture from the inside out. You talk about the keys to your success as a Jazz team back in your era. Can you take those same principles of success that you used back in that era and apply it to an NBA team, namely the Utah Jazz, now? Would they work? They still work. Um, basketball is unique in that respect in that the fundamentals don't change. Uh, the players can change, the culture of teams can change, uh, the game itself has changed a lot in the last 20 years with the, the influx of international players that have come into the league. But the fundamentals always uh, are something that you go back to. When the Jazz are not playing defense, they don't play very well. Right? Uh, when they're not taking care of each other out there on the court and guys are just out there thinking about their own scoring averages, um, things don't work so well. When they pull together, like we've seen the last month or so, boy, what a remarkable shift where guys are there for each other. You know, there was that instance a couple weeks ago where that player from the Timberwolves took out Ricky Rubio and the whole the team got right there behind him and Jay Crowder was right in the middle of it, you know, letting the other team know like, hey, we protect our teammates. And that galvanizes a team that really pulls people together and you get that emotional connection and that emotional commitment that really is the difference between being just a group of guys out there on the floor and guys in a team of, of, of people who are really there for each other. To the casual observer, it looks like the Jazz have really come together in the last month. But that has to have been, that, that was not something that happened overnight. That has been coming for quite some time, has it not? Well, it has, and, and it takes time. And, and give Quinn Snyder credit for that, that he's stuck to his guns even when the team wasn't playing that well. Of These are the fundamental things that we're going to be known for, and we're going to learn how to execute them one way or another. And sure, injuries play into that, and you've got trades, and, and obviously uh, there were some personnel shakeups at the beginning of the year. So it takes time to build that rapport and, and, that, and congeal everybody together and go move in the right direction you know, in the, in the same direction at the same time. Uh, but, uh, but again, if you commit to that philosophy over time and you get the buy-in from all the players, and once they start to see just a little bit of the results, it becomes infectious. Rudy Gobert, 7-2, 2.3 blocks per game average right now. When you retired, you are 7-4, 3.5 blocks per game. What is the secret to blocking shots? Well, for me, it was something that um, uh, it was something I did somewhat naturally, and and again, I mentioned that story about Wilt Chamberlain, and and he said, you know, just you know, guard the basket. That's your job. Stop players from getting there. And I took that to heart. And I really looked at it as my job was to guard the entire other team. Like I watched other teams plays and I looked at when do they drive to the paint? Who's coming in? And I didn't block that many shots of the players that I was guarding. A lot of times it was the guy who was coming from the opposite side that I felt like I'd get over there and cut off his path to the basket. And Rudy does a lot of the same things. He's, uh, he's become more and more of a defender and he has great timing. He has great skills. His arms are longer than mine. And, uh, and he does just as a super job out there. And, and I think he really enjoys it. And part of it is also a commitment. It's not a, a job that you get necessarily a lot of accolades for. Nobody says, you know, hey, great defense on all those guys tonight. It's more of an internal thing that the coaches notice. Uh, but, but we've seen this year when Rudy was out, you know, the boy, it was like I-15 opened up down the, down the middle of the floor. And when he's back in, um, he, the, the, the players have a much more difficult time scoring. And the defensive field goal percentage starts going down a little bit. So it, it makes an impact, even though it's not something that always shows up on the stat sheet. Was it Frank Layton or was it uh, Wilt Chamberlain that told you, don't try to jump, just stand there? Uh, yeah, that's something that I learned early in my career is that your tendency is to want to jump and 
in block shots and really your job is to be an impediment is to get in the way to cut off the path between the player and the basket and so of course once you stop doing that then everybody says well he can't jump that's why he doesn't jump <laughs> he's a white but, guy he can't but, jump but, but the real the but the <laughs> but obviously the the point there is 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 your job is to stop the other team and bill russell once told me he said you know you don't want to swat the ball into the third or fourth row you want to control the ball you want to get the ball back and you want to get back to your teammate and push it down the floor because those little things like block shots and deflections and steals create momentum and Frank Layden used to always to tell us like I want to get 60% of my points off of the fast break I want to play great defense I want to create our own opportunities that's much easier than walking the ball up and trying to grind out an offense really interesting to watch how you played under that basket because truly it almost flat-footed I mean you weren't flat-footed but it, it seems almost that way and all you did was put your hands up and that yeah. was so effective. Well, when you're seven four, you can do something like that. So again, it kind of goes to my that back to my point of doing what you're excellent at. That was the one skill and talent that I had. And so I said, all right, I'm going to leverage this as much as I can to to help my team win. And if the team wins, I get to stay around for a little bit longer. Uh, so that was really the the impetus behind it. And, and I tried to stay within my own. Um, you know, my own box, so to speak, of what I felt that I could do well. Um, because we had Adrian Dantley, we had Carl Malone, we had these guys who are great scorers. So the team really wasn't looking to me to be a great scorer. They're looking for me to take care of the other end of the floor. That's what I did well, and it, and it worked well for our team. To be the goalie. You're the goalie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now, you mentioned uh, a number of the other uh, Utah Jazz players. Utah Jazz players from your era, most of them have long ago left, but you stuck around. Why? You know, I, uh, I grew up in Southern California, and uh, when the, the kids were littler, it was fun to go back there and go to the beach and things like that. But over time, I really felt like this was my home. Uh, I felt more at home here in Utah than I did back in Los Angeles or Orange County, as nice as those places are to, to be weather-wise. Uh, and um, live, I've always lived up around the Park City area, and uh, and I just enjoy the outdoors. You know, I've got had 30 elk in my backyard this morning. Oh, wow. Um, so that kind of stuff gets me excited, and I'm probably more of a mountain person now than I was a, a beach guy uh, growing <laughs> up. And uh, so... Um, the people have embraced me and, and the community, and I've, I've um, always felt a lot of love here and, and um, you know, opened a business here. We've been, a restaurant been open for 22 years here, and so uh, that was kind of fun, giving back and creating those jobs and, and really kind of leaving your imprint on the community. Uh, and uh, it's just been a, a great place to live, and I've just I've loved every minute of it. What are the similarities between the NBA and the restaurant business? <laughs> The similarities between the restaurant business and the NBA, you're only as good as your last meal, uh, <laughs> and you're only as good as your last game, right? doesn't matter what you did last week, last month, last year, right? It's about today. It's about executing today and being on the top of your game every single moment, and I think that was, that's, that's the similarity that's what uh, drives success in the restaurant and drives success um, in the NBA as well. Tell us about your charity, Standing Tall for Youth. Yeah, so uh, Staying Tall for Youth, I ran for 14 years, I, and we ran um, uh, basketball camps and outdoor programs for at-risk kids. And the premise that, of that organization was to create more of a life skills component as opposed to just a sports camp or just a hiking trip. And so we ran camps um, with a, a friend of mine, Brent Snyder, who uh, played at Utah State, played for the Bears. Uh, he was working for the Covey Leadership Center, and he and I got together. We created this model of this camp, and we raised the money all year to support the kids to come to the camp who couldn't afford to come to something like that. And so we did that for a long time, helped over 3,000 kids. And, and one of the stories I cite in my book was uh, one of the young ladies that came to us from Ogden uh, who um, was kind of a rough kid to start out with when she was 11 or 12, stayed with us for a few years. She ends up getting to be 16 or 17. We kind of lose track of her. And then just a couple, three years ago, I get a Facebook request from her. And I'm like, oh, man, it's so good to hear from you. How are you? And she doesn't respond back. And she sends me a photo of her master's in social work from the University of Utah. Oh, I'm my. like, you know. Yeah. If we helped that one kid, that was, that was worth Mike all drops. the years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mike drop. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. Last year, Gail Miller uh, announced the establishment of the Utah Jazz Legacy Trust to ensure that the team always stays here. When do you think the Jazz are going to win a title? <laughs> 
Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the, a title is an elusive thing, that's for sure. Uh, and I think that, you know, those couple of years that came close in 97 and 98 when, uh, you know, with unfortunately Michael Jordan had other ideas, were great years. I think He pushed I, I, off, by the way. He pushed he, off. Well, he admits that now. Everybody knows uh, that. Yeah, he admits that now. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, a, it's really about coming together at the right time of the season. And the competition is very stiff. But uh, I'm very impressed with what Dennis Lindsay and, the, and the, the general manager uh, of the team and everyone has done in the last couple of years in terms of personnel selection. They've been snake bit by injuries a little bit the last couple of years, but it seems that they're getting high quality players, high caliber players, and guys who really understand how to play the game. And so I think that bodes well for the future, that we're always going to be competitive, always going to be right there. And, you know, it just takes that one or two little little things that, that make that difference in the playoffs to get yourself into the finals. But it can happen. Do you think that this year's team has what it takes to win a title? Well, I think they've definitely made some improvements over the last uh, month or so. Um, and if they can keep everybody going the direction they've, they've been going for the last uh, short while, uh, yeah, I mean, I, can, I think they could go deep into the playoffs. And again, it's about, it's about hitting the right cylinders at the right time of the year at the, you know, the end of April, uh, really playing your best basketball. What has playing in the NBA taught you about life? Hmm. Playing in the NBA, uh, I, I think I learned how to push myself beyond where I thought I, I could go. Uh, it taught me about excellence. It taught me about consistency. It taught me, taught me about um, integrity in terms of, of saying and doing what you said, you know, doing what you said you're going to do and really being there for your teammates because they depended on you. Uh, and, and having been playing, play, and having played in a sport, really at the, at, at the highest level. You know, and that's one thing I, I learned in business is, is you know, a lot of people say we're a team, we're a team, we're a team. The unique thing that I learned and other players learned to play in the NBA is we're part of a very small elite group, right? There's only 430 players in the NBA, something like that. And so you're playing team at the highest level, night after night. And you can't wait till the next board meeting or the next corporate retreat to get you know, problems figured out. You lose three games in a row this week, you could be playing in a new city next week. So. Yeah. So I think that's what it taught me was uh, let's get stuff resolved right now. Let's not let anything simmer. Let's get it handled. Let's move past it because that's the only way we can get back to the winning ways or giving ourselves a chance to win. And I think that's something I, I take to heart all the time. I don't let things simmer or sit around for too long. It's like if it's an issue, let's get it handled and move on because that's not serving anybody. Did you know that before you started playing professional basketball? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I think uh, playing in the NBA is definitely uh, a, a bit of an emotional roller coaster, but you also learn how to get a little tougher. Uh, you learn how to let stuff just kind of roll off your back a little bit more. Um, you try not to get too wound up about any one situation. You, know, you don't get too high. Over, you don't get too high after a win or too low after a loss. Uh, because you've got another game the next night. So that consistency and that consistent effort, and that consistent commitment to excellence, um, I think is something that is just drilled into you and you experience it playing 82 games in a year, right? You just, you just have a little, a little bit of everything happens. And uh, so I think what I took away from that is, is just that maybe even keel of, of not getting too wound up about any one thing. As you mentioned just a moment ago, there is a ton of talent in the NBA. I mean, you, you take the upper echelon of talented basketball players and you're going to find them in the NBA. But there seems to be quite a bit of difference when you start looking at team stats, which teams are winning and which teams are losing. I mean, you can have a really talented team but have a horrible record. What is the difference between winning and losing teams in the NBA? The difference is really the players understanding that winning is going to help their career. Uh, and I, there's a lot of great coaches out there, but getting those five guys committed to each other out on the court is really the key. Like I watched the Jazz recently here play against uh, the Pistons when they came to town. They, they were having a rough night and they weren't helping each other, just out there taking some shots and kind of going through the motions. And you can see that in a team. Uh, so it's, it's really the ability to help those players understand that if I help my teammate, if I really pull together here, if we start playing as a team, that that's going to help me too. And, and it takes some, sometimes some very skilled coaching to get a player to understand that, especially one who's been lauded most of his life and career, to be able to sit down and say, look, you know, and, and let's look at the horizon together. Where do we want to go? 
um, you know, I need you to do your part like I need this guy to do his part. And if you guys are willing to commit to working to each, with each other, you know, the sky's the limit. But that's uh, obviously uh, often more easier said than done. Uh, because uh, there's, there's some players that will never buy into that. They're just, I'm going to get my shots up, I'm going to get my stats, I'm going to go home, punch my time clock, and I'm done. And unfortunately, that doesn't work, and those guys end up get traded around the league, and a few years later, like, gee, whatever happened to that guy? You know, he was so good on that team so way back when or in college. But the inability to understand what it takes to be a, a, a good teammate, I think, is the difference. Can we peel back the curtain just personally for just a moment? And at 7-4... You are noticed everywhere you go. Is there such a thing as being inconspicuous as a <laughs> seven foot four inch man? And what is life like for you? Uh, no, there is nothing. Uh, there is nothing that's inconspicuous, I guess, unless I'm, I'm in my house with the doors closed. Uh, you know, a trip to the gas station sometimes is, is an event for somebody else who, you know, wants to come and say hello. Um, for the most part, it's great. Uh, I don't mind it, and I've tried to use it to my advantage. I think part of life is accepting who you are and saying, all right, this is who I am, this is what I do, let's go with it. Uh, and, um, but yeah, there's times when it's, when it's challenging or difficult, or it's 11 o'clock at night at the airport, and you just want to get in the car, go home, and, and people want to say hello or you know, take a photo. And you know, for the most part, that's fine. I don't have, I don't have any issues with that. Uh, but it's, but it, you're not, uh, there's no place to be inconspicuous, no. I mean, I, was, I was spoke in Cabo San Lucas last week and rolled into the hotel, and here's four people from Park City there. I mean, it's just like, you know, you just, uh, um, we all travel a lot and we get around, and so you, you really can't go anywhere and hide. I've been in out of the way places like Belize or Costa Rica, and the NBA is everywhere. It's in 220 countries. So um, there's a famous picture of me in the airport in Belize City of me standing with this little short guy that owns the bar in the, in the, in the uh, airport there because they're huge NBA fans. That's all they watch at night when they go home is, is uh, what they call it, N e NBA, e uh, NBA e down there in S Central and South America. So they know everybody, know everything about you. And it was just shocking to go there and then take another connecting flight to a little hotel in the very south part of the country. And the moment I landed in my hotel room, there was somebody from Radio Belize who wanted to interview me. And I'd already been a retired by for 10 years or so by then. Oh, so it's, yeah, that's how it does. Well, Mark Eaton, former center for the Utah Jazz, author, entrepreneur, thank you so oh. much for being part thank of you, Three Bob. Questions. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate you taking the time to visit with me.